This week on Q&A, a professor takes on what he calls 10 of the greatest misreported stories in American journalism. His name is W. Joseph Campbell, and his book is called Getting It Wrong. Joseph Campbell, in your book, Getting It Wrong, there's this quote. American journalism loves giving prizes to its own. Why did you put that in there? Well, I think it's true. It's, it's absolutely the case. And uh, American journalism is a real prize-giving uh, profession. And it's, it's, uh, it's one that um, uh, some, some critics have said should be reined in. It's, it's, not a, um, it's not a major part of getting it wrong. But nonetheless, it's, it, it's characteristic of the profession at, at large. Why to do reward they? themselves for, for good work. And, and some of the rewards, let me say, are, are well-deserved. The Pulitzer Prizes every year, they come out in April and, and reward and recognize good work from the year before. Very impressive work, almost always. And uh, so some of these awards are, are well-deserved. Well There's just a lot of them. And I'm not the first to, to point out how frequently journalists like to, to reward themselves. How long have you been teaching journalism? I've been teaching at American University for 13 years, and I taught a little bit as an adjunct before that. University of Hartford in Connecticut. How many years did you work as a journalist and where? I was 20 years in the profession. I broke in at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, covering the police beat at 6 at night to 3 in the morning in downtown Cleveland, and worked up uh, to the rewrite bank and then general assignment and investigative reporting. I was in Cleveland until 1980 when I joined the Associated Press in Geneva, Switzerland, and I was a journalist in, in Geneva, and I also had some uh, fill-in stints substitute reporting stints in Warsaw, Poland during the early 80s, during a fascinating time when, when the Solidarity Movement was taking hold and, and really posing a, a direct challenge to, to Soviet rule. And it was an electric time. It was really a great time. I also reported from Abidjan and Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa for the Associated Press. And uh, I also was a national reporter for the Hartford Current in Connecticut before entering journalism education. Before going into detail about any of these different incidents in history that you write about. Um, would you give us, first of all, give us an overview of what this book's about. The book Getting It Wrong discusses and debunks 10 media-driven myths. And these are stories about and or by the news media that are widely believed and often retold. These are prominent stories about journalism and journalists. But these stories under close inspection, under scrutiny, dissolve as apocryphal or wildly exaggerated. And I characterize them as the akin to the junk food of journalism. They're appetizing, they're appealing, they're tantalizing, but they're not terribly nutritious or, or healthy in the long run. I want to do this quickly and then come back to some of them. Okay. Uh, let's go down the 10. I'll read off the chapter and you can just give us a little paraphrase on all this. Number one, I'll furnish the war, the making of a media myth. That was William Randolph Hearst's famous vow to furnish the war with Spain at the end of the 19th century. Uh, it's, a, it's a widely known, widely believed, and widely retold anecdote. It's perhaps the best known anecdote in American journalism. It's certainly one of the oldest. It's almost certainly untrue. Hearst himself denied having said that. Two, uh, fright beyond measure, the myth of the War of the Worlds. The War of the Worlds radio dramatization of October 1938 by Orson Welles. Great radio entertainment, a very inspired show. Orson Welles was 23 when he did this. And it supposedly set off nationwide panic and mass hysteria. But in close inspection of, of the available evidence, there is very little to indicate that that was the case, almost certainly apocryphal. Three, Murrow versus McCarthy, timing makes the myth. Indeed. The uh, Edward R. Murrow, the famous Edward R. Murrow show, See It Now in March 1954, supposedly stopped, Edward, uh, stopped Joe McCarthy, Senator Joe McCarthy, in his tracks in his communist and government witch hunt. But in reality, Edward R. Murrow was very late to, to taking on McCarthy. Other journalists had been been uh, addressing McCarthy and his bullying ways for, for months, if not years, before Murrow finally took him on. So Murrow was very late, and he acknowledged it, too. Four, the Bay of Pigs, New York Times suppression myth. The notion that the uh, New York Times, under, under pressure from the Kennedy administration, spiked or held back or suppressed its reporting about the pending invasion of the Bay of Pigs in April 1961 is the heart of that myth. And uh, But close inspection, reading what the New York Times printed, for one thing, quite clearly shows that they, they reported an awful lot in a lot of detail. And there was no evidence at all that Kennedy, in advance of publication, asked the Times to hold back or suppress any of its, any of its pre-invasion stories. Five, debunking the Cronkite moment. 
the Cronkite moment. That's probably one of American journalism's best known anecdotes, certainly of the 20th century. Uh, Walter Cronkite's famous program at the end of March, at end of February 1968, supposedly altered American war policy and swung public opinion against the war and forced or prompted Lyndon Johnson to reconsider running for re-election. All of that is untrue. Six, the nuanced myth, bra burning at Atlantic City. Bra burning at Atlantic City. Uh, that's That was a protest by the... Um, uh, it, was, it was a feminist protest, one of the first feminist protests of the, of the 1960s, late 60s. And uh, they protested the Miss America pageant in 1968, which was held at Atlantic City. And during the protest, they, they discarded into a large trash can, which they called the Freedom Trash Can, uh, instruments of what they called torture for women. And that included bras and girdles and high-heeled shoes, as well as issues of Cosmopolitan and Playboy magazines. Uh, the, the, the notion is that uh, the feminists set fire to their bras and, and waved them demonstrably over their heads in a really fiery public spectacle. Uh, my research shows that that's almost certainly untrue, that if the, if the bras and other items were set on fire, it was very briefly in the Freedom Trash Can at, the, at this demonstration in 68. Seven, it's all about the media, Watergate's heroic journalist myth. Yes, the heroic journalist myth of Watergate, the notion that two intrepid and, and uh, young investigative reporters for the Washington Post, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, through their investigative reporting, brought down Richard Nixon's corrupt presidency. It's a very beguiling notion. It's a very uh, appealing, delicious story, but it's untrue. Uh, even the Washington Post uh, principals, Woodward himself among them, have said over the years that the, the Post did not bring down Richard Nixon. What brought down Nixon was a was a a combination, if you will, of forces, including federal prosecutors, federal judges, the U.S. Supreme Court, bipartisan congressional panels. All of those were at work to bring down Nixon and expose the, the depth and dimensions and extent of the Watergate scandal. About 20 people went to jail for their criminality, and these were either associated with Nixon or uh, working for his reelection campaign in 1972. Eight, the fantasy panic, the news media, and the crack baby myth. The crack baby myth is supposedly that uh, uh, women who took crack cocaine during pregnancy would, would give birth to, to uh, offspring who were f would be forever dependent. And some commentators, both on the political left and political right, forecast that there would be this bio underclass of dependent young people. As they grew up, they would be wards of the state, essentially. And there would be this huge number of people who, who were forever damaged by the uh, prenatal exposure to crack, crack cocaine. Uh, it seems not to have been the case. That, uh, that crack was not the, uh, I mean, it's not a good idea to take this stuff during pregnancy or at any time, but nonetheless, it didn't seem to have that effect. There is no crack baby syndrome, as there is a fetal alcohol syndrome. Number nine, quote, she was fighting to the death, unquote, myth-making in Iraq. Myth-making in Iraq. Jessica Lynch, the 19-year-old uh, young woman who was uh, uh, caught in an ambush in the early days of the Iraq War, and uh, was taken prisoner and, and then later rescued by U.S. Uh, commando team uh, early in April 19, uh, 2003. And uh, Jessica Lynch's uh, um, uh, battlefield heroics were reported by the Washington Post. These, these, tended to, these were quite incorrect, quite in error. And uh, uh, they, they, uh, the Post, Post story about Jessica Lynch fighting to the death in Iraq was was untrue and it turned out to be almost certainly a case of mistaken identity that it wasn't Jessica Lynch in that unit who was fighting to the death it was another uh, another person Sergeant Donald Walters and finally 10 Hurricane Katrina and the myth of superlative reporting right Hurricane Katrina it was the uh, uh, it, it, landfall of Hurricane Katrina was in uh, 2005 and uh, supposedly the news media were, were aggressive in their reporting and, and calling attention to the, to the defects in, in the uh, response, the, the state, local, and federal response to the, to the hurricane. But also, in addition, the news media coverage of the, of the extent of the, of, the, of the damage and the extent of the, of the um, uh, lawlessness that supposedly was unleashed by Hurricane Katrina was quite wrong. It was hardly a moment of superlative reporting. The news media got that story quite wrong. Estimates of death tolls that exceeded 10,000 were wrong by an order of magnitude. The fact that uh, the wild, widespread looting, widespread pillaging, raping, murders were going on in New Orleans in the aftermath of the hurricane, all that was untrue. And it had the effect of, of really uh, impugning a city and its people at an hour of their most urgent need. 
in the back of your book in a footnote, number 16 on your conclusion, um, you cite a Pew Research Center study. And this is from 17 March of 2008. The ideological composition reported among national journalists surveyed in 2008 was 8% conservative, 32% liberal, and 53% moderate. Where would you put yourself? Uh, probably in the moderate category. And what does that mean? It's, it means that you neither take the, the extreme conservative view or the, a more extreme liberal view. It's, uh, um, it, it's kind of in the middle. That, that data are interesting because it, it does point to a, an imbalance, obviously. An imbalance that, that Pew and others have pointed to in American newsrooms, that it does tend to be center left rather than any other direction. And I think that that uh, does tend to lead to a certain element of groupthink in American journalism newsrooms. And uh, it's, it's, it's a cause for some concern and, and uh, probably more debate and discussion than it's been given. Has this book been picked up by the 8% of the conservatives in the in the, either the community or the people in the public, they're more than eight percent conservative. See, see, I always learned. Well, I hope so. I mean, it's. I hope they're uh, reading the book, and I hope the other uh, ninety-two percent are, are as well. No, but what I mean though is, this, isn't this proof right here that uh, the people that are outraged about the media have been right? Your book. It, uh, it. Well, the book is a little more nuanced than that, and I, I think that uh, a message I try to get across in the book that it's not a media bashing book, but but one that's aligned with a fundamental central objective of American journalism mainstream journalism in this country and that is trying to get it right and this in the book does try to to set the record straight to the extent that we possibly can so I think it's aligned with with one of the fundamental objectives of American journalism rather than bashing the media there's a lot of that going on probably enough of it going on acknowledgments out front you start the book by saying in late summer 2005 Reed Malcolm a senior acquisitions editor for the University of California Press asked me by email whether I had ever considered writing a sort of the great myths in journalism book. That's not what I want to ask you about. Later on you say, so began a collaboration that has resulted in this book. While we had our differences, Reed and his colleagues at the press were always courteous, helpful, and professional. That line begs the question, what differences? Oh, there were a couple of differences about the, um, the title, for one thing. Uh, getting it wrong was not necessarily my first choice, uh, but, you know, the, the the publisher has final say on that, so that was that was that was their call. What would have been your first choice? You know, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I would like to have seen something with myth in it, because the book does address and, and uh, debunk media-driven myths. But uh, I think I tend towards more clunky titles, longer titles. This this has the advantage of being pithy and memorable. And uh, um, I was hoping too, maybe the subtitle would would work in a uh, a reference to to media myths, and it. it instead discusses 10 of the most you know, misreported stories in American journalism. And this is only paperback? That's right. That's right. I want to go back to some of these, uh, some of the 10, and run some video and get okay. you to expound a little more on it. Uh, Wonderful. The first up is a clip of Walter Cronkite from February the 27th, 1968. Uh, this is from a, what was a special. That's right. A special uh, half-hour report on Vietnam. What was in the, the aftermath. In the aftermath of the Tet Offensive, which was a surprise attack across South Vietnam by North Vietnamese and their Viet Cong uh, allies in the South, and uh, it took the American military and the political establishment in, in this country by surprise. And Cronkite went to, to Vietnam in the aftermath of, as, as the Tet Offensive was winding down and did some on-the-ground reporting and came back and, and aired, as you say, on the 27th of February 1968, this special report about Vietnam. Here's just a little bit of it. Let's see what he was saying okay. back then. To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe, in the face of the evidence, the optimists who have been wrong in the past. To suggest we are on the edge of defeat is to yield to unreasonable pessimism. To say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. On the off chance, the military and political analysts are right. In the next few months, we must test the enemy's intentions in case this is indeed his last big gasp before negotiations. But it is increasingly clear to this report that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victims, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. This is Walter Cronkite. Good night. You have a quote supposedly from Lyndon Johnson. He told 
the country in a few weeks right after that that he wasn't going to run again. Uh, right, the end of March, 1968. That's right. Quote, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost middle America. I've been reading that for years. True? There is no evidence that Lyndon Johnson ever said that. And the power of this, of the anecdote that's discussed in, in getting it wrong, called the Cronkite moment. Uh, supposedly, Lyndon Johnson was watching the Cronkite show and at the end of it, when Cronkite intoned his mired in stalemate assessment, Johnson supposedly leaned over and snapped off the television set and, and said something to the effect of, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost middle America. Or if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the war. Or if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the country. I mean, there are various versions as to what he said, a lot of various uh, versions as to what Johnson supposedly said. And that, in my view, right off the bat is a, is a tip-off. It's a marker often of a media-driven myth. If you can't get the story straight as to what the president supposedly said in reaction to this, then there's something probably wrong with it. But more than that, it doesn't take much research to find out that Lyndon Johnson was not at the White House that night. He was not in front of a television set. Lyndon Johnson was in Austin, Texas. He was attending the 51st birthday party of Governor John Connolly. And at the time when Cronkite was editorializing in his conclusion about being mired in stalemate and perhaps negotiations might be thought of as a way to get out of Vietnam, Lyndon Johnson was, was, was making remarks at the, on the campus of the University of Texas at Austin about Connolly turning 51, saying something to the effect of, well, John, you've reached the age that all politicians, or the, the magic number that all politicians shoot for, a simple majority, you know, 50 plus one. All right, it's not the greatest joke ever told, but nonetheless, Johnson's not sitting in front of the TV set bemoaning his fate and realizing his policies in, in tatters. He's making light with, with an old political ally at a, at a you know, black tie dinner, a black tie uh, reception in, uh, in Austin, Texas. Moreover, Johnson in the aftermath of, of the Cronkite show is out on the stump publicly saying we should, we should recommit to, to end the war in Vietnam successfully. Let's bring home a victory. And he's saying this on more than one occasion in the aftermath of the Cronkite show. So if this was such an epiphany for, for the president, he really didn't make it very clear that this had changed his mind in his public comments afterwards. And the power of this anecdote lies in the immediate, abrupt, and decisive effect that it supposedly had on Johnson and his thinking about Vietnam, that, that Cronkite suddenly crystallized for him what was going on in Vietnam. And that's just not the case, because Johnson clearly is out there in the weeks afterwards saying, you know, let's, let's redouble our, our national efforts. Let's recommit to, to a successful conclusion of the war in Vietnam. So he's who? Not, he's not uh, saying, woe is us, the war is over, we're, we're, we're in bad shape, Cronkite told us, and, and now we have to leave. Who's perpetu who perpetuated the story then? Well, the, the uh, did he? By the way, did Walter Cronkite get an award because he said that? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Are you sure? Uh, I'm not sure, but I don't think he got an award because of that program. It is one of the most memorable bits of Walter Cronkite's long career, this so-called Cronkite moment. But it's an interesting thing about media-driven myths. In many cases, the principles involved afterwards say that, you know, this, this really didn't have that kind of effect. And for a long time, Walter Cronkite made that same kind of comment. He said, this, the, the, my, my comments about Vietnam represented, he said on one occasion, uh, a, a straw on the back of a crippled camel. He made that kind of remark in his memoirs, which came out in 1995, I believe. Cronkite only later in his life began to embrace the notion that, well, it did have a powerful effect. But for the most part, his, his reaction was, no, this is really, this is not that uh, dramatic. This really didn't have that, uh, that, that powerful of an effect. But it's, it's, it's one of these neat, tidy, delicious even stories about the news media and their power that, that's one of the reasons that it lives on, that it's, it's, it's so compelling and so interesting and, and demonstrates so vividly the power of the news media that that's one of the, certainly one of the reasons why it, uh, it has endured for, for quite a long time and lives on to this day. A year ago, we had a man here named Frank Mankiewicz who wrote a column that didn't get very much attention. But in that column, he said, and I'll read it, Cronkite had a meeting in the late 60s with Senator Robert Kennedy. I sat in as Kennedy's press secretary. The meeting was understood to be off the record and no one else was present. Cronkite began with an acknowledgement of Kennedy's desire not to run for president, but pleaded with RFK to change his mind and to announce his intention to seek the White House right away, Then, even though the election was more than a year off. 
and then I'll read one more in the paragraph here. You must announce your intention to run against Johnson, Cronkite urged, to show people there will be a way out of this terrible war. Kennedy listened intently and asked Cronkite his opinion of the battlefields he had seen. The war can't be won, Cronkite told him. What we gain on the battlefields and in the body count during the daytime, he said, we lose to the villagers at night. Uh, what do you think the reaction would have been if the public had known that? Combine all this. This at was that in time. 1967. Uh, it's it's pretty clear that that public sentiment about the war had begun to shift, and had begun to shift well before the Cronkite moment, well before Walter Cronkite's editorial comment that he expressed on air. By October of '67, a plurality of Americans had said that sending U.S. troops to Vietnam was a mistake, and the Gallup organization had been asking this this question since like 1965 and had been doing so on a regular basis and by October 67 this plurality emerged and it the numbers like like 47 percent thought it was a mistake the numbers were pretty close throughout uh, the fall and early winter of, of 1968 but uh, sentiment had begun to shift well before Cronkite took to the air. Let's go to another one of your 10 articles. Um, this one is way back it's the War of the Worlds, radio only. Uh, we're get, we've got some audio to play, but before we do that, set it up. This was on the eve of Halloween. It's October 30th, 1938, and Orson Welles, who is 23 years old, a boy wonder, uh, is uh, the head of the Mercury Theater on the air. He's directing and starring in, in this weekly, hour-long radio program. And they've been on the air since, I guess, the summer of, of 1938. And uh, he uh, and his tr and his troupe uh, begin a, um, uh, the program that night was adapted from H.G. Wells's 1898 science fiction thriller, The War of the Worlds. H.G. Wells set the story in England. Orson Wells set it in the farmland of central New Jersey near a little hamlet called Grover's Mill. And... Uh, he made use of, of uh, simulated newscasts, simulated radio bulletins, to propel a sense of urgency, of, of danger, of distress, and did so in a very imaginative way. And, and supposedly, supposedly, Americans by the thousands, if not tens of thousands, thought the program was so realistic, so lifelike, that they took to the streets they headed for the hills in utter panic. Mass hysteria gripped the country that night, supposedly, supposedly. Here's the, some audio from that uh, broadcast. And near the end, there's a four-second pause, which is a part of the whole thing. So don't think there's, there's a, our audience think there's a technical problem. Let's listen. Ladies and gentlemen, my on? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that adjoins Mr. Wilmot's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk and as long as I can see. The more state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain's conferring with someone. Can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now, now they've parted, and the professor moves around one side, studying the object while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole, flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what anything means. Wait a minute, something's happening. A humped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from that mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Oh, Lord, they're turning into flames. Oh, the whole field's caught up by the woods of fires. Are... The gas tank, tanks for the automobiles spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. That's the clip. Great, great radio entertainment. It's it's marvelous, and it's it's amazing how seventy plus years later, War of the Worlds, the radio dramatization holds up. It's it's, I, I play this for uh, one of my classes almost every every year around Halloween time, 
And uh, often the students are riveted by this. It's, it's, it holds up marvelously well. Well, in one of the headlines you have, the Chicago Herald and Examiner, it says, Radio Fake Scares the Nation. And in your piece you say, Wells uh, gleefully endorsed the notion that the broadcast caused widespread panic, saying, quote, houses were emptying, churches were filling up from Nashville to M Minneapolis. There was wailing in the street and the rending of garments. Is any of this true? I think that, that Wells's characterization came many years afterwards. This was in one of the biographies or perhaps an autobiography he did with one of his uh, uh, colleagues. But his immediate reaction, Orson Welles's immediate reaction to the, to the radio show was one of astonishment. Like, how could people really take this seriously? I mean, there were tips and cues embedded in the program that, that would give people the notion that this is this is this is what it was radio show a radio show that was well done and uh, so he was he was perplexed as to how people could have confused this some of the best research that was done on this uh, in the immediate aftermath or shortly after the show indicates that maybe seven million people listened to this and of that number one million 1.2 million were frightened or scared or upset by the show, that alone is, is a small minority. And what you know, the, the, the person who did the research didn't really operationalize, didn't define what he meant by frightened or scared. And so it's far from saying a mass panic seized the country that night, that hysteria reigned across the United States. So most people who heard the show recognized it for what it was. Good entertainment. Did anything change after this in, in the media? Not that I'm aware of. There were some moves afoot. The FCC, is a, the Federal Communications Commission, is, a, is a, an early entity. It's in its first days as a federal agency. And there was some movement to try to keep radio from, from doing this again. But it proved to be unwieldy, improbable, and, and difficult to, to, to navigate that kind of terrain because it does edge into censorship. Newspapers, though, in the aftermath of the, of the War of the Worlds, seized upon this as a real opportunity to bash radio. Radio wasn't a new medium at the time, but it was an upstart medium, and it had begun to encroach upon traditional print media in terms of its news delivery capability as well as, a, as an advertising medium. And so for newspapers, this represented Orson Welles' show, represented a great opportunity to, to hector to lecture radio on its responsibilities. That radio was a new medium, but it, it still was, had a lot to learn and still had a lot to grow up. It, it had to learn how not to mix news with entertainment, as newspapers had learned many, many years before, said some of these commentaries in the aftermath of this. So it was a great opportunity for newspapers to, to bash radio. We have some, uh, a movie clip here we're going to show in a moment, of Orson Welles. How big a deal was he back then? He was both in this War of the Worlds and in the uh, movie that had to do with the I'll Furnish the War story. Yes, that's right. Orson Welles was, was, a, uh, was a prodigy. He was really on a roll, as they say, 23 when he did uh, uh, The War of the Worlds. And then a couple of years later, 1941, actually three years later, he comes out with Citizen Kane, which is his masterpiece. And he's only, what, 20, 26? I mean, that's, that's, that's great work. He did terrific work. I think Citizen Kane is perhaps the best motion picture, best American motion picture ever made. Who did he play in that? He played Charles Foster Kane, whose character was loosely based on the life and times of William Randolph Hearst. And uh, I think it's pretty clear that, that uh, Wells meant this to be a, a jab at, at Hearst and his, and his uh, people close to him. And, uh, and Hearst tried, through his subordinates, to get the movie uh, killed, to, to keep it from ever being shown. So what was, who was Hearst at the time? His name's still around. That's he right. still have newspapers. That's there. right. Um, William Randolph name. Hearst was, the, was, a, was a newspaper mogul, a media mogul. Uh, he he uh, owned a lot of newspapers, but also was into to radio and television. And so he had, a, he had a, an empire in the 1930s and 1940s. He had begun with, with a newspaper in San Francisco. Later in the 1890s, mid-1890s, bought the New York Journal in New York City. And that became his flagship newspaper. And, and for some of the more illustrious days of Hearst and his, and his aggressive activist journalism, we're in New York with the New York Journal in the run-up to and the aftermath of the Spanish-American War. So in this clip, uh, keep your ears on. Uh, you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. He paraphrases it a little bit, but yeah, yeah it's close enough. Okay, let's watch it. 
don't know how to run a newspaper, Mr. Thatcher. I just try everything I can think of. Charge, you know perfectly well there's not the slightest proof that this armada's off the Jersey Hello, coast. Hello, Mr. Bernstein. Excuse me, Mr. Bernstein. Can you King. prove it isn't? This just Mr. Bernstein, in. I'd like you to meet Mr. Thatcher. I'll just follow How do you do, Mr. Guard. Thatcher? Leland, uh, Hello. Mr. Thatcher, my ex-guardian. We have no secrets from our readers, Mr. Bernstein. Mr. Thatcher is one of our most devoted readers. He knows what's wrong with every copy of the Inquirer since I took over. Read the cable. Girls delightful in Cuba, stop. Could send you prose poems about scenery, but don't feel right spending your money. Stop. There is no war in Cuba. Signed, Wheeler. Any answer? Yes, dear Wheeler, you provide the prose poems. I'll provide the war. That's <laughs> fine, Mr. K. Yes, I rather like myself. So, right away. I... Frank, uh, Frederick Remington is the, a name that wasn't in that movie, but right. how does he fit into this? Frederick Remington was the artist whom William Randolph Hearst sent to Cuba to illustrate and draw sketches of the Cuban rebellion that, that had swept the, the island by 1897. Remington travels there in the company of Richard Harding Davis, who at the time was becoming the best known, most eminent foreign correspondent, war correspondent in the United States. So Hearst, this is a real coup for, for Hearst to send these two eminent individuals to, to Cuba. And supposedly, supposedly, uh, Remington found that everything was quiet in Cuba, that there was not going to be a war with the United States, and he sent a cable asking Hearst to, if it would be okay if he returned. In reply, Hearst supposedly said, please remain. You furnish the pictures, and I'll furnish the war. And the, the uh, Orson Welles, the Citizen Kane clip you just showed, is a paraphrase of that famous line, furnish, I'll, you furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war. Hearst denied ever having said that. The Spanish authorities in Cuba, it was Spanish run at the time, controlled the incoming and outgoing telegraphic traffic. So there is no way that they would have allowed a message like that, as inflammatory and meddling as William Randolph Hearst's Furnish the War message supposedly was, there's no way they would have allowed that in. There's no way that those messages would have flown freely from New York to, to Cuba. There was a war going on anyway, so, so Hearst to say, to vow to furnish a war makes no sense on its face. It's illogical. Why would he say that when war was the very reason he sent Remington and Richard Harding Davis to Cuba in the first place, the rebellion that was going on? And by early 1897, when Remington was there, most Americans knew that there was a, a very vicious, ugly conflict going on. And it was the forerunner. It gave rise to the Spanish-American War 15 months later. But um, for those and other reasons, it's almost certainly apocryphal. And the sole source for this anecdote is a journalist named James Creelman, who wrote about it in his book of memoirs called On the Great Highway in 1901. And Creelman, he had a reputation for exaggeration, for, for overstatement, for bluster, for putting himself in the stories, too. He loved to talk about himself as the journalist. He mentions this not in any great detail, but mentions it almost in passing, but as an example of the forward-looking kind of journalism that William Randolph Hearst was practicing. He meant this anecdote, Furnish the War, as a compliment to Hearst and a compliment to the kind of journalism, the activist-oriented journalism that Hearst was practicing at the end of the 19th century, that it was anticipatory, forward-looking. And it was only years later, particularly in the mid-1930s and early 1940s, did the interpretation get twisted or changed or altered to the malignant interpretation that we know it is today. You furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. Well, this is an example of Hearst at his worst, a warmonger. And as you know, and you write it in your piece, a lot of people keep repeating this and repeating it, including a 1997 movie. The movies, as you say, seem to perpetuate this. Here's right. a James Bond. Let's just look at this 45-second clip. And it seems you can't resist any woman in my possession. What are you waiting for? Shoot him! I told you. We're going to finish this together. How romantic. Don't you realize how absurd your position is? No more absurd than starting a war for ratings. Great men have always manipulated the media to save the world. Look at William Randolph Hearst, who told his photographers, you provide the pictures, I'll provide the war. I've just taken it one step further. Sorry about that. I uh, tuned out there for a moment, Elliot. How do you stop something like this from, I mean, and, and how much do you blame Hollywood for keeping this up? 
Well, Hollywood certainly has been a, a mechanism to, to solidify, to propel media-driven myths, some of them. And uh, this story is almost too good to, to, to resist. It's almost too good to be disbelieved. And it's, it's nice, tidy, pithy. It's everything that, that a, a memorable media myth is and should be and can be. And so there's, there's, uh, it, it's irresistible in many ways. I think the way to combat media-driven myths is to, is to, direct, to attack them directly and to, and to point out how flawed that they are. And now there's a school of thinking that says that, you know, when you do that, you repeat the essence of the myth, you actually perpetuate the myth in trying to debunk it. I think that's a risk worth running in order to try to combat these. I can't think of any other way to do it. I can't think of any other way to, to, to take them on and to debunk them. I think the weight of the evidence is, is the, best, the best friend that a debunker has. Why did you leave uh, print journalism to go into teaching? It was a, it was a gradual process. And uh, I had, be, had begun as an adjunct at the University of Hartford in Connecticut and, and liked the classes that I was teaching. And uh, I had an opportunity through the Freedom Forum to uh, get my PhD. The Freedom Forum is a media foundation in, in, uh, based in Washington here. And uh, they had a program for veteran journalists to uh, go through and, and obtain a, a PhD and then enter journalism education. So you'd have the credentials of the academy, plus you would have substantial professional experience. It's a, it's a great combination, I must say. And, uh, and so after completing the PhD program at Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina, I uh, entered the, uh, joined the faculty at American University. And I've loved it. Been there ever since. Any sense that the the public is walking away from newspapers because of years and years of what they think is bad reporting? I think I think media consumers have long condemned the news media in general, newspapers as well as other outlets for for erroneous reporting, for not really getting the story quite right. And some of my earlier research on the Yellow Press period in the 1890s uh, points that out very clearly. There was there was a lot of criticism. A lot of uh, remarks about how the news media were getting it wrong, exaggerating, sensationalizing, and whatnot. This is this is a chronic problem. This is this is one that I think consumers will always be able to to muster and to criticize the press. And not to say the press doesn't deserve to be criticized. I think that they, in many respects, do need this this critique from the public and need, perhaps need to listen a little more closely to some of the critiques. Did the Woodward and Bernstein? Um reporting on Watergate lead to vast new numbers coming into journalism schools in the country? That is addressed in, in the book as a, under what I call a subsidiary myth, a myth that is spun off by another broader media-driven myth. The broader myth is the one of the heroic journalists that, that Woodward and Bernstein brought down Richard Nixon's corrupt presidency. The subsidiary myth is that Woodward and Bernstein, being young, their book, All the President's Men, came out when they were 30 and 31, respectively. Young guys. They made journalism look glamorous. They made journalism look sexy. And the movie, All the President's Men, which came out in April 1976, solidified that notion of journalism as a very sexy and entertaining and appealing profession. So thousands and thousands of young people decided to major in journalism, in journalism programs in colleges and universities across the country. The best research on this topic clearly shows that that's not true, that the surge in enrollments in journalism and mass communication programs at U.S. universities and colleges had begun well before Watergate, was underway well before Woodward and Bernstein became household words, names. Would those 20 people have gone to jail, gone to prison, if there hadn't been a Woodward and Bernstein? I think so, almost certainly. They probably... Richard Nixon, I think, would have survived his presidency. He would have served out his term, his second term, had it not been for the existence of the Watergate tapes. That's my view. I mean, there's no way of knowing this. And the Supreme Court forced Richard Nixon to, to surrender the tapes that, that really clearly showed his culpability, his guilty knowledge, his, his role in covering up or attempting to cover up the Watergate scandal. Had it not been for those tapes, I think Nixon would have survived as a wounded president, but would not have resigned. It was only because of the existence of those tapes and the Supreme Court's forcing them out under subpoena by federal special prosecutors that those that, that Richard Nixon finally gave up the office. Again, the movie, All the Presidents, man, Hal Holbrook plays the part of Mark Felt, uh, Deep, Deep Throat, Throat and yes. Robert Redford plays the part of uh, Bob Woodward, and then Dustin Hoffman 
Carl Bernstein. Let's look at just a little clip of they're in the garage. It's dark, and we'll come back. That garage, yeah. by the way, is in Roslyn, Virginia. Right over the bridge right, here from right, where we're exactly. sitting. Let's watch this. Cover-up had little to do with Watergate. It was mainly to protect the covert operations. It leads everywhere. Get out your notebook. There's more. Your lives are in danger. Hi. I finally got stolen on the phone. Any evidence that their lives were threatened? Not really, although the book All the President's Men alludes to, to the fact that Deep Throat, their uh, Woodward's anonymous source, uh, made such a representation. I don't think that they really were, their lives were in danger. So what do you say to your students? Uh, you have journalism students sitting in front of you. They're getting history off of Hollywood, which you say is often wrong. Or exaggerated or, you know. We, and we watch, as you point out, the, the media loves to give itself prizes and awards. Right. And I mean, they perpetuate this whole business. I think that uh, students are, are very shrewd, sharp, and, and, uh, and, and they can, although many of them have seen All the President's Men, many more have seen All the President's Men than have read All the President's Men, the book. Uh, I, I think that uh, students are, are inclined to be skeptical inclined to, to, to challenge conventional wisdom, many of them. I don't think they necessarily take this as gospel. I think they would, would, would critically assess this. And, uh, and I think that, um, you know, showing, trying to, to take this apart, to, to unpack the Watergate story, the heroic journalist myth, it becomes pretty clear that, that journalists alone couldn't have brought down the presidency, the presidency of Richard Nixon. I and mean, it's just too, too vast, too powerful too much in control. It had to be a combination of other forces and factors. As I mentioned earlier, the, the, the special prosecutor, federal investigators, grand juries, federal judges, bipartisan congressional panels, and ultimately the Supreme Court. You needed that to really get at the criminality of the Richard Nixon administration. I've never been able to find out how many, but there are tons of schools across the country that give an Edward R. Murrow Award, and the business gives an Edward R. Murrow Award. I'm going to read your last paragraph of the Murrow chapter uh, and ask you to embellish on this. There is no small irony in journalism's veneration of Murrow, who died in 1965. I think he was, what, 57, 58? That's right. That year. Mm -hmm. He was hardly, quote, a journalist above reproach, unquote. On his employment application at CBS, Murrow added five years to his age and claimed to have majored in college and international relations and political science. In fact, he had been a speech major at Washington State. Murrow also passed himself off as holding a master's degree from Stanford University, a degree he never earned. During the 1956 presidential election campaign, Murrow privately counseled Stevenson, the Democratic candidate for president, on, quote, the finer points of speaking into the camera, unquote. These days, such lapses would surely disqualify Murrow or any journalist from positions of prominence in America's mainstream news media. Keith Oberman, I think, signs off his show, Good Night and Good Luck, which was the famous movie now and the way that uh, Edward R. Murrow would sign it off. That's right. Again, what, what do those students say when they read a paragraph like this? Do they want to go out and get the Murrow Award? Well, it's a, it's, <laughs> it's a good uh, reminder about the, the dangers of resume padding. I mean, it can come back to haunt you. And I, and I think that's right, that, that uh, Murrow probably would not today hold those kinds of positions, the prominent position in American journalism, mainstream American journalism. You know, had it been known that he was uh, privately counseling a Democratic candidate or a Republican candidate for president on the finer points of using television. The resume padding, I mean, that's a lot of that information is from, from biographers of, of Edward R. Murrow. This is not 
unknown detail. Yet, you know, the, the man's aura and his, and his journalism tends to, to outweigh the, the, those deficiencies and those flaws. He, here's a, a, a clip of, of Edward R. Murrow around this Joseph McCarthy controversy. It's not too long. Okay. But we cannot defend freedom abroad by deserting it at home. The actions of the junior senator from Wisconsin have caused alarm and dismay amongst our allies abroad and given considerable comfort to our enemies. And whose fault is that? Not really his. He didn't create this situation of fear. He merely exploited it, and rather successfully. Cassius was right. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Good night, and good luck. What's all that mean? It, well, first of all, it's great television. It's great advocacy journalism. Uh, Murrow is wrapping up his 30-minute program about McCarthy and advising Americans not to uh, not to be terribly afri afraid of this of this guy, the the menace that that McCarthy was. But by then, by March 1954, most Americans were not waiting around for a white knight like Murrow to say, "Hey, this this McCarthy guy, he really poses a toxic threat to the country." By then, they knew McCarthy's ratings, his favorability ratings, had been slowly declining since the end of the year before, since the end of 1953. Other journalists, including a guy named Drew Pearson, who wrote the Washington Merry-Go-Round for many, many years. He was a muckraking journalist. He, he injected himself in sort of all phases of Washington life. He was really kind of a, a, a unique character almost. He took on Joe McCarthy early, in like 1950, right after McCarthy began his communists in government witch hunt, claiming that, that the communists had infiltrated high levels of the State Department, of the Army, of the Democratic Party, and so forth. Pearson took him on and, and uh, revealed McCarthy's claims as being largely hollow. And, and, and Pearson paid a bit of a price for this because McCarthy, it's hard even to, to imagine this today, but 60 years ago, McCarthy attacked Drew Pearson in the uh, cloakroom of the Soulgrave Club at DuPont Circle. There was a private dinner that they were both at, and they had been seated at the same table, and they were sort of trading jibes and, and barbs all night long. And at the end of the, at the, end of the dinner, um, McCarthy, the senator, cornered Pearson, the columnist, and uh, versions vary as to what exactly happened. Pearson said that McCarthy tried to knee him in the groin a couple of times. McCarthy admitted to slapping him real hard across the face. And another version was that McCarthy slugged Drew Pearson so hard that it lifted the columnist three feet into the air. Richard Nixon, who was also the same party, then a senator, broke, broke up, he intervened and broke up this, this confrontation. But it was emblematic of the, of the, of the difficulties and of the threats that, that, that McCarthy posed and would follow through on them with journalists. You, so, say, you say in your book that you... Uh talked with his stepson, Tyler Abel, right. uh, Drew Pearson's stepson, who, mm -hmm. by the way, is married to Bess Abel, who used to be the social secretary to Lyndon Johnson. Right. But what did you learn from Tyler Abel, who's still here and lives in the suburbs? Um, I talked with him about uh, the, the diary that uh, he edited, Drew Pearson's diary, which was a very important uh, resource for me. And also, um, he gave me clearance to use the photograph of Drew Pearson uh, with hat on that uh, that appears in getting it wrong, so uh, he was he was a very helpful source for me. Um, there, I have some more video, but but in your piece you talk about the fact that and I, this the source of this may have been Fred Friendly, who was CBS News president for a year, but worked with uh, Edward R. Murrow. Right. That Murrow became he was a friend of Bill Paley's, who owned CBS and paid him his salary, but they got they were at odds over the fact that Bill Paley kept wanting to give equal time to the people that they were attacking, and Ed Murrow seemed to not like that. What would that be all about? Well, in this case, in the McCarthy uh, case, he did offer right at the outset of the show, Murrow offered right at the outset to, to give McCarthy as much time as he wanted or the ample time that to, to respond to, uh, to, to Murrow's allegations. And, uh, and McCarthy took him up on it about three or four weeks later in April 1954, uh, McCarthy goes on the air and uh, does a very, very bad job, really a terrible job of, of uh, trying to defend and explain himself. Well, let's watch just a part, part of this. We supplied the senator with a kinescope of that program of March 9 
and with such scripts and recordings as he requested. We placed no restrictions upon the manner or method of the presentation of his reply, and we suggested that we would not take time to comment on this particular program. The senator chose to make his reply on film. Here now is Senator Joseph R. McCarthy, Jr., Senator from Wisconsin. Uh, good evening. Mr. Edward R. Murrow, Educational Director of the Columbia Broadcasting System, devoted his program to an attack on the work of the United States Senate Investigating Committee and on me personally as its chairman. Now, over the past four years, he has made repeated attacks upon me and those fighting communists. Now, of course, neither Joe McCarthy nor Edward R. Murrow is of any great importance as individuals. We are only important in our relation to the great struggle to preserve our American liberties. The Senate Investigating Committee has forced out of government and out of important defense plants communists engaged in the Soviet conspiracy. And you know, it's interesting to note that the viciousness of Murrow's attacks is in direct ratio to our success in digging out communists. Now, ordinarily, ordinarily I would not take time out from the important work at hand to answer Murrow. However, in this case, I feel justified in doing so because Murrow is the symbol, the leader, and the cleverest of the jackal pack which is always found at the throat of anyone who dares to expose individual communists and traitors. What do you think? Those attacks on Morrow did Joe McCarthy no good. And by that time, by the time he was on the air in April 54, his, his, uh, his favorability ratings were, were in decline and also his, his career, his, his career was in jeopardy. The Senate uh, was about to begin investigative hearings about McCarthy charges that had been raised by the Army that he had sought special treatment for one of his former aides on his, on his committee, a subcommittee. And those charges were the centerpiece of a, of a succession of, of hearings in the summer of, of 1954 and wound up leading to McCarthy's uh, being censured by the, by the U.S. Senate and his political decline and eclipse. And three years later, he's dead he's at age dead. 48. That's right. So you say that Joe McCarthy was not run out of this whole business by Edward R. Murrow in the end. That's right. That's right. Murrow was very late to taking on McCarthy. Uh, the, the toxic threat that, that McCarthy posed to American, to the United States, was, was well demonstrated long before Edward R. Murrow's program. You know, interestingly, Murrow himself said that, you know, he really did not want credit for, for taking down McCarthy. Fred Friendly, whom you mentioned earlier, Murrow's producer, also said as much. It wasn't the Murrow show, he said, that took down McCarthy. It was the Army McCarthy hearings in the summer of 1954. But then where does the myth start? Well, the myth starts pretty quickly. It's, it's seeded very early on. Um, a magazine called Telecasting Broadcasting uh, said they're going to have to, in the aftermath of, of um, Murrow's program, said they're going to have to change the definition of journalism now the, the, and, and extolled Murrow for his taking on McCarthy and being very courageous and so forth about it. And so it took on uh, this, this mythical overtone almost immediately. And at the time, television is, is making its clear entry into American households, into American living rooms. In 1954, it passes the threshold of 50% penetration. In other words, 50% of American households now have television. So television needs a defining figure. It needs a white knight. It needs someone like Edward R. Murrow, and it needs a defining moment. And that defining moment became the confrontation that, that Murrow had on, in March 1954, taking down um, Joe McCarthy. Also, it, 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 it's very well timed. I mean, Murrow didn't plan it this way, but the Army's charges against McCarthy take hold and are announced a couple of days after his program. So this coincidental great timing helps place Murrow at the center of this unraveling of Joe McCarthy, but he really was was uh, a subordinate player. So where do you come down on the spectrum of the argument today that you hear people wanting to go back to the old days, back to the way journalism was, 
they don't like the idea that there's a Fox News or a MSNBC where they're at each other's throat or a Rush Limbaugh. Better off today or worse off? Today? Absolutely better off today. I think that the more choices and the, and the more variety, the more options that are out there, the better. The better for, for American journalism, the better for American democracy, the better for the American public. I think what, back in the day when, when there was the Fairness Doctrine and, and just three major networks, I don't think American audiences, the American country, and uh, American journalism are well served by that. So I, I think the more, the more choices, the more options, the better. Even if we have uh, fond recollections of Edward R. Murrow, the media-driven media myths often invoke what I call the golden, others have called it too, the golden age fallacy sort of look back and say, oh yes, there really was a time when American journalism was respected, that journalists did great work, that they told truth to power, and their, and their work had an effect. And the Murrow story, the Murrow-McCarthy confrontation, just as Watergate, just as the Cronkite moment, all of those fall victim to the golden age fallacy, looking back in time to a period when journalists were widely respected and did great work. I saw on uh, a website that in, in 2006, and maybe there's been more activity since then, you were the teacher of the year at American University. Uh, that's the um, uh, student government. Uh, every year at American University uh, uh, gives an award for um, faculty member of the year, and I was the uh, lucky recipient that what, year. What techniques do you use in the classroom that gets you that kind of following? You know, I like to, to teach classes in a very interactive way even if it's a large class of 30, 40, or more students, to try to engage the students in the content and, uh, and not to strictly lecture to them, although there's some lecture and some presentation, but, but to, to engage the material, to, to have reading assignments that, that they are um, expected to, to have completed and then also to be ready to, to discuss. And that kind of uh, engagement, that kind of discussion-based learning, I think is very effective. What's next after this book? You know, I like to think that the universe of media-driven myths is not confined to 10, to 10 in this book. And I'd really like, although I haven't spoken with uh, the, the publisher about this in any detail, but I would like to think that there's a sequel to, to, uh, to Getting It Wrong. Getting It Wrong Part 2 or more Getting It Wrong or maybe is, a whole other title. Is there an interactive website for the people to get to you uh, on this book? Uh, uh, there are a couple of websites. One of, one of them is uh, mediadrivenmyths.com. And... Uh, uh, I can be reached also through wjosephcampbell.com, and I blog frequently about media-driven myths. What's the W's name? Uh, it's, uh, it's it's my first name, and <laughs> what is it? It's one my uh, my mother has uh, used. Uh, she insisted I use the W and, and, and not the and not the Joseph. I guess it's a family secret. What's it stand for? It's a family secret. Why is it a family secret? <laughs> well, it's one that I just never disclose. You never disclose. No, what's seldom. Your first name? Yeah, seldom. Yeah, well, this ought to be an opportunity. Yeah, it could be. I think I'll pass. <laughs> w. Joseph Campbell, Getting It Wrong is the name of the book. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Brian Land. It's a pleasure. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.